Hi, this is Michael Adams for CEO Roaster. And yeah, I have the, the pleasure to do another CEO Roaster web conference. This time it's with a new company, to me at least. I was introduced to the company by um, one of my fellows who's an institutional investor in Germany. And he asked me to yeah, do a video interview and, and get the story from Rice, uh, from Rice Gold Corp. Uh, trading on the CSE as RISE, R-I-S-E. And so, yeah, I took the chance and invited Ben Mossman. He's the CEO of the company, CEO and director, I guess, of the company. And um, yeah, it's my pleasure that, that he will run us through the story, through the background, and of course, about himself. So yeah, let's start off, Ben. Thanks for, uh, first, uh, thanks for taking the time to talk to me. Yeah, maybe tell us a little bit about your background first so that people uh, will know who they're listening to. Sure, thanks a lot. Um, well, I'm a mine engineer. I've been uh, in mining for about 15 years. I uh, worked in eight producing underground mines in northern west of Canada. I started my career in Yellowknife, the Con and, and Giant Gold Mines, which were uh, quite famous mines. I was there when those were eventually shut down. Uh, and then started a public company about five years ago, previous to this, where we uh, built basically permitted, drilled, you know, built and financed a small gold mine in British Columbia, which got to uh, profitable operation, was one of the only mines uh, in the world okay. that uh, that uh, didn't, uh, they used pre-concentration to uh, not have any surface disposal tailing. So I came on a CEO rise in August. They uh, asked me to find basically, you know, a top quality project which I had been looking at other projects in California and came across this project, the Idaho, Maryland, which is basically being sold as real estate. Uh, and then as things progress and doing our research on it has really turned into something uh, you know, very unexpected and uh, you know, quite substantial opportunity for the company. Yeah, and the company um, had some some structuring um, some time ago. So the, the new company is listed on the CSE since April 11th. Yeah, the uh, company listed on the CSE. It was a company has been a company for quite some time. It's a U.S. company. Um, was doing exploration in the United States several years ago, um, which didn't work out well for them. Uh, company was rolled back, you know, re rebuilt basically from the bottom up. Uh, they were working on exploration properties in BC before I came on, and now that we've acquired this project, basically bought the fee simple land of the Idaho Maryland mine. This will be our our only focus. You know, all, all the other projects that we have in the portfolio are, are basically irrelevant compared to the magnitude of this of this project. Okay, cool. Yeah, to, to be honest, when I took a look at your presentation. Um, Right from the start, I was really confused, yeah, because the mine is called the Idaho Maryland mine, but it's in California, so it's kind of, at least for a European, yeah. it's kind of weird. <laughs> how how did these those guys come up with the name? Well, basically, you know, back in the 1860s when the gold rush started, everyone would have their own quartz claim. So, so at the beginning of the mine, it started out uh, what we call the Eureka Eureka mine, which was the outcrop of the ore body. And then as it moved on to the next door neighbor's claim, was called Idaho, they took over the mining and were very successful huh. in mining the vein. And then eventually went on to a claim owned by the Maryland company. And uh, so it became the Idaho Maryland mine. And, and as each you know, mining company ran out of ore on their property, they would basically sell it to the next, the next door neighbor. And that okay. continued for the, for the entire first phase of the mine's history up to about 1900. And you know they mined a million a million ounces from one single vein, the Idaho one vein, 1900, and uh, and then it sat, a couple of different outfits came in over the next 20 years, and eventually uh, Aaron McBoyle succeeded in consolidating all these other mines into one single uh, company, so it became the mm -hmm. Idaho Maryland mine, although it also includes the Brunswick mine. So I guess they decided you know. It's a bit too long to call it the Idaho, Maryland, Brunswick mine. So yeah, no, it's just because I, Idaho as well as Maryland are also U, uh, U.S. states, right? And so is California. So, but, but anyways, <laughs> so maybe we just start with the with going through the presentation. But for the the German audience, um, the company is not yet listed on the Frankfurt uh, Stock Exchange, but it has a WKN number. It's A2DQV. 
VW. And um, so if you want to buy, you probably have to buy directly on the CSE in, in Canada. Um, but this WKN number will definitely help. Okay, yeah, um, Ben, maybe just with, uh, start with the presentation. And if I have a question, I will just interrupt you unpolitely. Sure. Yeah, and I'll just mention that all this is pretty new. We just finished buying the property in January of this year. And a huge amount of data from this mine. It was a major past producing mine. Produced 2.4 million ounces so far at really high grades. The average head grade is half an ounce a ton, around 17 grams per ton. Over the last two months, you know, we had about six people working full time, you know, seven days a week, compiling all this data and digitizing all the data because basically no one has ever seen the documents of this mine. You know, in the, uh, you know, when it was running, it was very secretive in the area. It's a major gold camp, <clears throat> Newmont's right beside it. So they, they didn't want anybody to know the geology of the mine or the mine workings because they were busy acquiring as much land around them as possible. So, okay. so the last government survey was done in 1940, USGS survey, which are pretty, pretty big deal. They're, you know, take years to do them. The entire report is written about the nearby mine adjacent to us, the Empire Mine, which is owned by Newmont. And mm -hmm. no information at all about the Idaho, Maryland. So when we bought the project, we knew what was available uh, in the history, you know, the production history. But until we had actually gotten that data and did the work, it was, uh, you know, unknown just exactly what those workings looked like. So, so, it's, so it's brand new, brand new uh, information. You know, we just got our website up last week. You know, we have we're listed on the CSC. We'll be moving up to uh, other exchanges and looking uh, to get, you know, other listings in Germany as well. So, okay. so it's a new, a new story. Okay, cool. Yeah, just let's dig into the presentation because there's a couple of things that you just mentioned that are laid out there too. Sure. So, so we own the property. It's all the original mine hold, or mineral holdings of the Idaho, Maryland mine. And we don't own all the surface land. When the, what happened in the 60s, they sold the surface rights and kept all the mineral rights. And then that property was bought by a local couple in Grass Valley, uh, which eventually ended up being purchased by us. So we actually own the fee simple land. We own the land and we own 100% of it. We paid $2 million US for all the property. There's no royalties on it. This mine was a major past producing mine, it was number two gold producer before it was shut down, World War II. Produced up to 130,000 ounces per year in 1940. So it's a very significant project. And immediately right beside this, this mine is the Empire Mine, which produced 6 million ounces by Newmont. And in, in the Grass Valley in Nevada County, Gold Camp produced 13 million ounces. So a lot of people will know about the mother load in California, but Grass Valley was actually the number one gold producing district in California. And this mine was the second largest gold producer in California, with the first. And it was it, it was shut it, and it was shut off because of the war, or what was the reason? Yeah, so basically, an engineer called Aaron McBoyle put the last last kind of uh, glory days of the mine, put all this land together, became one of the richest men in California from the mine, was already at the second biggest gold producer in the United States, second only to Homestake. Uh, was doing 130,000 ounces a year and had just finished a major expansion to the to the mine. They put a brand new head frame in, new crushers. They were going to drive the shaft to 5,000 feet and double the production from 1,000 tons a day to 2,000 tons a day in 1942. And because of the World War II, the government, you know, had a, had a shortage of copper and zinc and needed that metal to build war machines to you know further their war effort. And they ordered this gold mine and, and basically any other gold mine that didn't have a valuable base metal byproduct to shut down because they wanted the miners and the resources to go to base metal mining, and not gold mining. So basically at the drop of a hat, they ordered the mine to shut down. Only a very limited crew stayed to maintain it. Um, the company was paying huge dividends out, you know, something like 97% of the profits were going out as dividends, so they weren't keeping, uh, you know, a, a big cash balance. I, I think they did that for tax reasons, but um, they, they probably weren't expecting that this to happen. 
and the leader of the company who owned half half his shares, um, this kind of genius mine engineer called Aaron McBoyle, spent the war years lobbying the U.S. government to allow him to reopen the mine, at least on a small scale. He was unsuccessful to get that to happen. Uh, he had a stroke during the war, which left him paralyzed. So he died a couple years later. So, so when they reopened, so they had lost their leader. They had very little capital. They hadn't maintained the mine, so they lost uh, access to a lot of their high-grade areas on the Idaho mine. And when they restarted, they uh, used tribute miners, basically contract miners, that were paid half the gold that they mined instead of using their own crews. So it was really devastating for the mine. So instead of doubling their production from you know, what they started at 130, they would have been something over 200,000 ounces a year. Uh, they went the other way. They dropped production to 50,000 ounces. Uh, of course, the gold price was fixed at $35 an ounce. The uh, cost with inflation were 15% a year higher. So eventually, you know, they had lost all their economy of scale. And this mine closed down of uh, gold mining in 54 and permanently in 56. And many of the other mines closed as well. Um, next door neighbor mine, a new mine shut there, Empire Mine down in 56. So the company at that time, you know, probably expected that the gold price fix would never come off. And they sold, they, you know, let the mine flood. They auctioned off all their equipment. They sold uh, the surface of the land off and then eventually sold the mineral rights and some key surface property around the main shafts to a local couple in the town. So, and they went on to make um, aircraft parts and uh, silos for missiles and things like that. I think the company still exists actually, but. Okay. So, so this kind of great mine that was on it was at you know top the top one of the top mines in the United States, and was getting ready to double production. It just was shut down on the, on the drop of a hat, uh, and then forgotten. So you won't hear a lot about this mine, even though it was such a huge producer, um, and and mostly because these documents, the actual geology and mine workings of the, of the mine are just not available in the public domain. It's not written into the geological reports. You can't find a section showing uh, anything other than the original number one vein. So, so it's really interesting now to actually get the data, which was kept safe in this local basement for 60 years, <laughs> and take a good look at what this mine is. <laughs> and some of, this, some of this information is, is is it's really it's really detailed you know the mine was a really well run, run operation they have things uh right down to uh each drill bit that was used um for the diamond drilling in the mine so you know ledgers monthly reports for every single heading uh information on some 70,000 uh meters of diamond drilling channel samples you know geological reports done from some of the some of the you know highest uh regarded our geologists from that era, and all of this information is non-public, so it was never published, and no one's ever completed the detailed geological modeling of the mine. So, so it really is kind of a first. Um, it really is a, a really interesting opportunity for sure. And some of these things, like they'll be talking about headings below, like right below the number one vein, which already had produced a million ounces. At over an ounce a ton head grade, so the institute grade would be higher than that. But um, right underneath it, in 1942, they were driving an exploration heading. You know, the entire thing was channel sampled every six feet, and the average assays are are over an ounce a ton, like something like 1.2 ounces per ton, with channel samples up to 14 ounces a ton. And then in the reports from that, for when it was shut down, the monthly geological reports. They, uh, they're basically saying in there, you know, make sure that you restart this heading after the war's duration. And then you look at uh, the maps and, and the information, and it was never restarted. So it's just sitting there for all these years. And not a single hole drilled under it, you know, nothing like that. So, and then the same thing from exactly the other side of the, of the same vein on the same level. You know, they, they had drilled just before uh, in the 50s. You know, found that the one vein was there on that side as well and started drifting from the from the eastern side and then the mine was shut down permanently. So, you know, something like that number one vein 
a continuous vein that produces over a million ounces at an ounce per ton on average, or greater than an ounce per ton on average, you know that that's extremely rare. There's not uh, maybe maybe three or four in the in the history of mining that are like that. Uh, you know, there's mines that have produced million ounces at high grades, but from a single continuous vein, that's very um, very rare. So I think there's a couple yeah. of slides in there talking about the historic production, right? So if we move forward, yeah, yeah, this, right. Yeah, this is um, this we put it, put all the information together from all the monthly reports. Um, there is information published. Uh, in many cases that are similar to this, this is the uh, this is the result of a summary from all the internal documents of the mine. So reconciled to uh, to the bullion that was actually sold to the mint um, from their metallurgy report. So so you know our first step was basically to see what are these mine workings exactly look like. So we mapped all the digitized all the mine workings, uh, went through all the documents to figure out exactly what was mined from each vein. And effectively, in this mine, you have two styles of mineralization: the Idaho, which are these really high-grade veins, gold veins, on the outside of this porphyrite block, and then on the inside of the porphyrite block, you have Brunswick, which is lower grade but but fairly extensive uh, veins and vein stockwork. So, so the Idaho produced um, 1.6 million ounces between the one and three. The number one was the was the original vein, and then right beside it, the three vein. Um, which was discovered in 29, they discovered this three vein system, which is very similar to the Idaho, but, um, but offset from it. In 1929, they discovered this three vein, which, which basically catapulted the mine from a couple thousand ounces a year all the way up to that 130,000 ounces a year. So, so very high grade. You know, some of these uh, stories that you'll read on the mine, you know, they're talking about actually when they're mining uh, some of these high grade pockets, they'd actually take the ore. And put it into a lock safe. I mean, that's how high grade some of these areas were. Okay, so it's very it's very funny to uh, hear you talking about low grade and low grade on average is still nine point three grams per ton, right? So, but anyways, um, yeah. so is this? Let me ask you a question: Is this all gold only, or do you have byproducts like silver or copper? Which is this real gold? Yeah, this this deposit is 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 gold in quartz. So. So it is effectively just gold. Um, there is silver in it, but a very minor component, like something like uh, less than an ounce per ton silver for every ounce of gold. So the silver is a minor part of the potential revenue. Um, yep. There is tungsten, tungsten in the mine, but I, I don't think that that would be important economically. They did mine some tungsten before the final uh, shutdown uh, because there was a big demand for tungsten. But, uh, but it, it is a gold mine. Um, Three million gold, of very high recoveries by by gravity. So over you know in those last uh, years before World War II, we've done some metallurgical studies which we news released. But uh, very high recoveries overall, 96 percent, and very high gravity recoveries. So so that basically means just coarse gold that's not um, that can be right. liberated and separated by gravity. So so very very good recoveries and very high potential payables. Um, when you're actually million ore type like this, you know, could you get very high recoveries and very high payables because you're taking it right to Dore at the mine site? Um, so. so that's that's the basic story of the production. I mean, we we have um, put out some of the data that we've done so far on on the metallurgy, uh, the production. You can see from this graph. Um, that's how dramatic it was. I mean, it, it it was right at basically 29 here, you know, right here is where they made the discovery, and then quickly ramped up the production, started you know adding more mills, and then right when they're here, this is this is where they plan to double the double the production rate. So they were going yeah. well. They had planned to go well beyond this, and I put all this capital in to do it, and then it just shut gets it gets shut down. And goes to zero, you know. So with no money, fixed price of gold and and inflation, you know, they tried to recover, but but there's just no way that they could, you know. If they had maybe succeeded in doubling the production, 
the economy of scales may have made them able to be profitable at $35 and, and increasing costs, but but that uh, it didn't happen. So, okay. so that's where that's where it's left. That's some of the recoveries that we talked about. Yeah. Some of the history. I mean, it's, it take take out thinking probably a couple hours to tell you the entire story uh, or more. But uh, but there's a, there's a recent book that came out about Errol McBoyle. Um, that okay. people that are interested in the mine could could buy uh, was written uh, and came out in, a, in just last year. But Aaron McBoyle was was a very smart business guy and engineer. You know, put this put all these mines, all, all these properties into one single company. You know, it's interesting uh, how similar things are to today. But you know, going to San Francisco, raising money to uh, you know get get up back underground. Finds this three vein, which is you know huge grades, and you know becomes comes you know, one of the richest people in California. He had uh, you know racehorses and orchards and all these things, and uh, yeah, and then at the end of the day, I guess lost it all and and his life. But uh, and for all, for all the guys who are interested to read through the whole history, um, the presentation is available on the website, and I think that's also a link to this book you just mentioned, right? Yeah, it's a really, really interesting book. I think that anyone who, who likes mining or gold mining or even business uh, would want to would want to read that book. So that's why we put it on there, and yeah. uh, you can order it. it. Comes from the United States. Okay. So. Okay, so that, that was the history. Let's let's move into the future or into into nowadays. So where are we? Yeah. So this this is that this is the property boundaries you can see on this map. So those are all the mineral rights. So there's 2,700 acres. Of mineral rights, that's all the holdings of the original mine. Um, the surface of the land is mostly um, owned by other parties. You know, they have a quick claim deed with our company that we have all the necessary and convenient rights to extract the gold under 200 feet. So, uh, you know, the stuff that the resource is quite a bit deeper than that, obviously. So, um, you don't need to own that surface land other than some critical parts. Uh, we own some land here on the Idaho side. Probably isn't going to be useful for the future. Uh, the more key parts here are this uh, Brunswick lot here, which is the main the vertical shafts, you know, in here. And then we have an option to purchase this 82-acre parcel right adjacent to it, which is an old uh, sawmill site. Okay. So you see, uh, you'll see the Empire shaft. That's their incline shaft here, and then the Star Mine was around here. So right adjacent to it, Newmont still owns all this. Um, all this mineral rights right adjacent they own something like six thousand acres and the empire mine you know, produced six million ounces let me ask so, another question so wh why do you think that newmont did not buy this land if it was available for like 50 years yeah they didn't have information but they know they have the adjacent project so why didn't they show any interest yet yeah well, it's, it's kind of interesting how that could stay there and i mean that's kind of the question that gets asked a lot you know how could something like this still be available? And basically, we bought it for the price of the surface surface lots. You know, the 93 acres are worth the 20,000 acres. So, and, and basically, the story is that this information was never published on the geology of the mine. So, you'll read these internal you'll read these internal reports from uh, when the mine was running, and then 48 or 51, and they're and and what they're saying is you know, there's too many exploration targets to list, and and uh, you know we have to explore all these different areas. But the, but you'll read reports or articles from the 70s, and it's the opposite of that. It'll it say it says things like you know for any price of gold, the Idaho Maryland is mined out. So because of this information was just wasn't there, the story basically got turned around in the 70s to say that you know the mine's mined out, and I think. If people had realized or had been able to see the geology, you know, when the gold came, price came out to fix in the 70s, this mine would have been uh, picked up. It would have been explored, and and many of the mines similar to this that were that were picked up after gold fix, you know, they're still in production today. So, so it's just the way that things happened in history. You know, the documents, all the all the <laughs> library of documents um, when the property was bought in the 60s. They went into a local basement in Grass Valley, and they basically never came out of there. A uh, company, you know, did have a lease in the 90s, yep. from 90 to 2013, 
and they didn't finish uh, the digital work on it because their focus was more on uh, dewatering the mine, originally to dewater the mine, which they got a permit to dewater the mine and do, uh, just get it back underground. They weren't focused on exploration. After 45, okay. spent $45 million, only a million of that spent on drilling, of which was far to the west near the original uh, outcrop. So that protected it for a long time. They decided to build a ceramic tile factory in the site and, and uh, permitted that or try to permit that. So they kind of got distracted by this industrial minerals and kind of forgot, you know, that they they had a lease on this. Uh, okay. What 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 is you know potentially pretty significant, uh, you know, ore body. So so that that was the story of it. And, and you know, and over the years, uh, the people that owned it, uh, they died. Give it to three of their friends. They inherited it, and then those three friends subsequently died. So it was in these family trusts and. You know, I expect that after all these years dealing on this, dealing with this lease and not getting paid for the property, um, they just decided, you know, we just want the money for for the property and and not and they put it up for sale for the price of the real estate on a, a real estate website. You know, we came across that. You know, at first I dismissed it, you know, for a couple months, just thinking same thing that anyone else would think when they first take a glance at it that oh, it's just some old old time. California mine that's mined out, and then I started reading about, you know, in the mineral uh, yearbooks from that from that era about how they had doubled their mill size right before the shutdown, and how they had been using these tribute miners up after their, you know after World War II. So I mean you don't you don't you don't do a huge capital expansion like that if you think your ore body is going to be depleted, yeah. and when you turn your mine over to your miners on this tribute basis, I mean, that's a sign of desperation. It says to me that that they're completely undercapitalized and they wouldn't have been able to even have the funds to explore something or, or you know, a, a single person can't afford to do the capital development to, you know, op, you know optimize their mining method. They'll just take whatever they can get to, even if they're leaving behind, you know, three quarters of, uh, of the mineralization behind, so that's what originally got me interested in looking into it, and then, and then we purchased the property, you know, not having the, the detailed maps and information. I mean, the family that owned it was very good at maintaining these documents. They wouldn't allow any of them out of the basement, so so they were preserved for all this time, which is pretty unusual. I mean, there might be other other things like this around, but if there is, more than likely those documents have been lost. Um, over the years, and with all those documents, the mine is worthless because you don't know where the tunnels are, you don't know the geology. It would be starting right. from scratch with, with you know, all these workings sitting underneath you. So yep. it's a pretty unique situation. It's something that I wouldn't expect that we could find. You know, we would never expect that you could buy something like this, mm -hmm. simple land for for, for two million dollars. Uh, that was yeah. I was just about to ask you. You paid two million. That's U.S. or Canadian? A uh, U.S. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So this is uh, sure this next next map. So this is this is a plan view of all the mine workings. Kind of hard to see, but uh, we'll upload these maps to our website so yeah. people can look at them. But uh, you know that that's the one vein there, three vein Idaho, then the Brunswick. So that's really detailed. I mean, that all those all these maps, mine maps were scanned. Traced in AutoCAD, you know, put into 3D. So it's a lot okay. of detailed work, um, which is which is uh, quite important to understanding that. But you know, you read like I read those, these books before we got the data, and it's and really interesting to actually see where these places are that they're talking about. So yeah, so this is kind of, this kind of stuff has never been seen by anybody except for the original workers of that mine. And never being put into into digital. So, we probably don't want to get too far into like the real uh, nuts and bolts, but of the geology. But this is kind of an important report. The tech report is going to come out um, within a couple of weeks or so. That will okay. have a lot of this information in it, so people can look through it. Um, this person here, Alan Bateman, 
wrote a report in 1948, and uh, he was a pretty top-notch geologist from that time, uh, Professor Gale, and he did a, spent a month in the mine studying the geology, you know, put together a very good report on uh, structural geology, how the mineralization was in place, those kinds of things, which which are which are very useful um, for us to to start or to start an exploration program to find uh, to try to expand you know the resource to uh, depth. So so it's pretty unique. It's not like it's not like uh, you're just you know drilling holes blind. In this case, like you have you have a major mine with all this production history, so you know you know about the continuity. Of the, of the of the veins, you know about the metallurgy. You have guys like Bateman who have done all of these studies, so you have uh, a geological model. And now that we've digitized it, we have a digital model. So, so this is a huge advantage where we actually have a property here that is drill has drill ready targets um, because of the the zoning in Nevada County because it's on private land. <clears throat> Um, the diamond drilling is not uh, subject to any conditional permitting, so so we can drill basically right away. Um, we'll be preparing to do that, you know, which will require some more financing, but uh, we have the targets ready to drill and very substantial targets, you know, underneath this one vein. Uh, there's there's uh, all the veins the Brunswick have just they basically just stop mining at 1,600 feet. So, so easy targets to drill under underneath those uh, veins. You know, some of these some of these uh, veins might like a thousand feet continuously um, vertical upwards, and then just completely end at sixteen hundred feet. So, and then these larger scale targets, which we call the crackle zone, basically Bateman, what he's saying is that because the uh, porphyrite block where the Brunswick uh, veins are, are are hosted. Paper is it gets narrow with depth. The more narrow it gets, the more subject to fracturing it will be. So, so the potential for this large scale gold stock works at depth, and that so that's kind of the, the you know the kind of blue sky target. In addition and above and beyond the regular kind of uh, one one vein, three vein, and Brunswick vein. So you have this potential for uh, for a larger scale ore body like okay. at depth. So. This is uh, some, just some diagrams we put up of, of, of the model based on, based on our, our digitization and Bateman's report. So, you know, the base, you have this porphyrite block that's being moved and fractured, which brings up the ore bearing fluid. So it, it's quite a simple model and quite interesting because uh, you know that the ore fluids have to move around the outside perimeter of this porphyrite block. So um, for any geologists that uh, are interested in those kinds of things, you know, a lot of good information will be in that technical report. Um, but it's very, it's very good to have something like that because you, you're not, you're not just drilling holes blindly. You know, you know where the, where the mineralization should extend to depth, so you can, uh, you can find your, find your drill hole. These slide, slides basically show, show the same thing. The path of your fluid. So we own land at the Brunswick shaft, which we can drill virtually the entire target down to this 5,000 foot um, below surface from our own land. Um, so that that's our initial goal. I mean, we have really kind of defined our our corporate plan from doing this data over the last couple months and and putting that together, you know, along with this tech, technical report, but. Some of these targets, I mean, you just have to drill them. They, uh, okay. they're, you know, they're just sitting there, ready to drill right underneath these drifts, where they basically just drop their tools and left. That's going to be the focus of the company over the next uh, year or two is is the exploration side of it and drilling under these uh, York veins to basically build, you know, a four to three one one compliant resource, which we expect. Going to be uh, very well received by by the public investors and and also uh, the mining industry overall. Right. Yeah. So that's that's just, uh, some of the modeling. So that's 3D model 
of, of, of the fourth right block, and that's one vein here, three vein here, and you know the entire perimeter of this fourth right block is mineralized with Idaho style um, veining, so that's this ounce per ton, or in three vein, 0.6 ounce per ton. And then on the inside of that block is the uh, Brunswick style here at Brunswick. So the door fluids move up kind of around the outside of this form Idaho vein, and then the fracturing of the Brunswick block um, fluids kind of move into this block itself and form these you know, lower grades, nine gram per ton Brunswick veins. And then here is this, uh, this is Brunswick style called the Zoo vein, which is on the opposite side, and this was just discovered in uh, 48, so it's quite a quite an exciting area there where you're actually starting to see Brunswick on both sides of the fourth right block. Some of the drilling that we'll be doing, we can drill through surface, through all this Brunswick style and the Zubin, and then into the Idaho. So it's quite efficient um, because you can hit both both zones with the same holes. Okay. Yeah, and this 5,000 feet is kind of, this is where they were targeting the shaft. So, so this is, um, this is the bottom of the vertical shaft. So they were mining here at a 1,600 foot level in before the war and pushing the shaft down as fast as they could. They got to 3,000 feet before it was shut down. He was intending to push this down to 5,000, all the way down to 5,000 feet um, with this mill expansion. So they were kind of getting a pretty clear idea of what the geology was. War was shut down, and that I think that's why that they were pushing that shaft down so quickly. Um, so, you know, in my opinion, they probably would have been able to double double the uh, production rate if they had not been shut down. So mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting. So that's that's the basics of of the project. Um, like I said before, it's 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 pretty early days for our company. And uh, we're just we're just getting started, you know, getting the website up, uh, getting this work done, the first tenth report. But but this is something that uh, is very very unique. You know, I would never expect, I never expected to be able to find something like this. Right. And just because of the way the history worked out and and timing that we were lucky to uh, be the ones to be able to buy it. Okay. Maybe what we should talk about is kind of the yeah right there the the share structure. Um, so what what are your? Of course, these are the numbers. Um, but but um, who are your ma major shareholders? You got uh, you just announced another financing. Is that already closed, or is it go going into a good direction? Or uh, yeah, it hasn't closed officially. But but so these numbers here um, assume that it is closed. We expected it would close this week, but it but it'll close uh, probably next week. But, okay. but all the all the descriptions are in. It's just a matter of doing the paperwork to close it. Right. So so that two million dollars is um, it's, it's not earmarked for drilling. It's, it's more to um, to get the company uh, more established um, and prepared for drilling. What we want to do is get this technical report done, which will be done in the next couple of weeks. There'll be a couple more uh, news releases coming out. You know, explaining more of the, the exploration targets in the mine. And then uh, getting prepared to market the company it hasn't been really marketed. It's, it's pretty much an unknown, an unknown yep. company. No one knows really about what we're doing, other than people that you know we happen to, uh, to bump into or you know or talk to about. Um, yep. So so there's a long ways to go. We think to get closer to what what we think is fair, fair as a market value. Um, so so we want to do some work on the, on the marketing side. And then get prepared to do a fairly significant financing, probably within say the next three months or so, to to start to start drilling. So hopefully we can uh, start drilling by late summer or fall, and then uh, you'll start seeing some of the some of the drill results from that. Okay. Can you oh, name yeah. some of the? Sorry. Can you name some of the major shareholders? Or oh, what's what's management and insiders own? Oh, well, the insiders, they probably own, um, between the various people who, who founded the company and are, are supporting the company, um, I don't know what the exact percentage is, but maybe 50%. Oh, but... 
Yeah. So, and then a lot of the company was sold during the last private placement that was done around Christmas time to purchase the mine. So the company had something around 30 million shares outstanding before we purchased the property. And then post this uh, 2 million financing, we'll have 66 million issued outstanding and 35 million warrants that are priced at 40 cents a share. So, so more than half the company are new shareholders. Um, I can't really uh, tell you specifically who, who those shareholders are, but, but they're all strong, uh, shareholders, you know, mostly uh, small funds or wealthy individuals who are, you know, who are in it for, for the bigger prize of uh, showing what this project really is. Okay. Um, it does, um, it does trade, trade well for, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I saw that the trading, yeah, for that you are not like really marketing the company, the, the, the trading doesn't look that bad. Um, no, actually, um, I was. I have two more questions. First, but I think there's another slide in there, and we should talk about the rest of the management team. Um, and second is like ju just your thinking. What what's your end game? Is your end game to really bring this project into production, or, or wait for Newman to buy it, or at least make an offer, or someone else? No, I mean, I think that once people see what this deposit is. And it's not hard to see that, you know, if you look at the drawings that, of the mine and actually, you know, understand the geology, I think it's not hard for people that know mining to understand that this deposit is a very serious um, exploration opportunity. Um, so that said, I mean, I think that this would be something that would fit into almost any gold producer's assets and, 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 and really could be a cornerstone of building pretty significant gold company on its own. So so I think like down the road, I think that it'll be difficult for Rise to take it to production just because it's going to be so valuable. And that, that doesn't mean that I wouldn't want to put it in production because I would. Um, as a mining engineer, this is something that would be really exciting to build. And we're going to be, yeah. you know, our focus on exploration to start, you know, say over the next two or three years, but if you're able to put a resource together that's similar to what was mined here before, you know, they mined 2.4 million ounces at, at half ounce per ton head grade, and the head grade, that's the mill head grade, so the in situ grade of that resource, you know, before the mine dilution would be would be significantly higher than that. You know, we don't know what, what it is, but um, you look, so you, when you compare this to other Deposits that are being mined today, if it was in production at this half ounce per ton, yeah. that sure. they're basically, you know, that's that's with the top ranking, you know, four deposits, including including Red Lake, which is producing at a half ounce per ton head grade. So it's a pretty big deal, you know. If you can prove that this resource is going to expand to depth, and and there's a lot of reports written about the Empire Mine, which basically say that there is no change with the tenor of the mineralization to depth. So, so we pretty, feel pretty confident that gold should continue to depth, to very deep depths. And, and a deposit like this, you know, is, is so significant that you would fully, you know, you can, you can make a pretty good speculation at least that right. you're going to, you're going to be able to drill a pretty good resource. So, right. Oh, great. So do you want to, to tell us a little bit about the other guys in the management? And, oh, that's a coincidence. I know Kale from his job at Eagle Hill. Really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's funny. Yeah. So, I mean, the company was set up when it was, when it was did the IPO last year as more of a, you know, grassroots exploration company. And now that we have um, the Idaho, Maryland, um, start talking to some people over the last couple of months about the project and you know different people that you know have pretty good records in the mining industry and and Alan Alan and Tom um, decided to come on the board uh, I guess just last week so so they they are really uh, really really good guys uh, both Americans Alan uh, came on as the chairman of the board it has a really uh, really strong resume you know he was the GM of, of the Grassberg mine you know 
had something like six six thousand employees working under him. And you know, with the, with the GM of three other major mines in the United States, he was the uh, chairman of Arrigo Gold uh, for five years before it merged with Alamos Gold, which is you know one point five billion dollar merger, amongst many other things. So a very experienced guy, um, you know, likes mining, and and you know recognized that this project was uh, was a great opportunity. So he agreed to come on the board. And then Tom, who uh, they were on a board together for AQM Copper, which was recently uh, bought up by Tech. Uh, Alan introduced us to Tom, and uh, you know, speaking to Tom, he, uh, you know, he liked he liked the deposit, so he, he agreed to come on as well at the same time. And, and Tom is, uh, you know, have a, has a long history in mining and, and geology, so 40 years experience. He was the uh, the vice president of exploration for Fortuna Silver. During the you know the drilling out and uh, expansion of their San Jose mine and and, and over the over those ten years, um, Fortuna became I think over a billion dollar company, so so they were quite successful. Yep. He recently retired from there and uh, and they came on our board. So he's not I don't think he's on uh, too many boards right now, but but uh, but yeah. So so it's kind of like a post retirement project for him and. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, so we're getting to know each other quite well, you know, and and Tom's got you know been involved in quite a few different exploration projects. So having guys um, like Tom and Alan on the board, and having that experience to know, um, you know, basically what what is the best way to explore on um, the project, where we're going to get you know the best return for for our shareholders. So so great great guys on the board. And we've got John who. Uh, who uh, you know has raised a lot of money for different companies in the past, so a lot of experience in the junior markets, and then uh, yeah, and then Kale, who's uh, who's a CFO and, and a director. So I think we got a pretty strong team coming together. As things move forward, you know, we get to this uh, to a major financing where we're going to start drilling. You know, then we're gonna we're gonna expand our officer team as well. Um, right now, you know, we, we don't we don't. Not necessary until we're ready to start, but you know we'll be adding uh, a working geologist, um, chief geologist, or or a VP exploration for the company, um, so that we can make sure that you know everything is done uh, most okay. efficiently as possible. Okay. Are there any slides left? Yeah, there's. Are we are we done with the presentation? Yeah. And that's a summary. Yeah, maybe maybe that's that's a good uh, finish. Yeah, maybe just sum it up again in your own words, and um, so that we have a conclusion. Yeah, yeah I mean, basically, that's this is the main important thing. Is like we actually own the project. You know, with fee simple land. That's that's really important in the United States. Um, you know, it's not we're not on public land. We're not in national forest. You know, so, so the permitting and all those kinds of things are always um, led by the county itself. That that that's a key thing. Um, there's no royalties on it. This was a major past producing mine, so 2.4 million ounces produced already. Very high grade. That's average of a half ounce per ton head head grade. You know, so 17 grams a ton. That's a mill head grade. So uh, that's not the situ grade. So people should understand the difference um, between that. And then inside that. Uh, 2.4 million ounces a half ounce ton. You you also have these Idaho veins, number one vein, which produced almost a million ounces a ton at over an ounce per ton head grade, and something like continuous, you know, plus one ounce per ton uh, single vein. There's maybe three or four of them in the entire history of mining. So very very unique, very special uh, ore body. Virtually all these veins are wide open for exploration for depth. You know, they put out the news release. Uh, people should look at that. That came out on number one vein target. You know, very uh, substantial indication that number one, that we could uh, expand the number one one vein to depth. Same with the Brunswick veins, completely uh, open for exploration below 1,600 feet. And then you have this larger target uh, called the Cracker Zone, 160 winds area, which has never been drilled. So, so very unique that way. Um, you know, we talked about the management. You know, we got. Guys who have very strong uh, careers, like Alan and Tom, who have come on our board, and 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 I think it's quite it's quite a good indication of the 
project, you know, Rise is just, you know, has just been a small company on the CSE, virtually unknown. You know, there's, when you come on, a, on a, as a director of a company like this, you know, you're not doing it, um, there's no need for these people to do that. You know, they're coming on because they're interested in the project and they think that it has yeah. good, a good potential. Okay, great. So first of all, thank you very much for taking the time to run me and educate me about um, Rice Gold. Um, so I think that was a very good um, first overview. I urge my viewers and subscribers to take a look at the website. Um, the presentation is on there. There's a link to the uh, book that Ben mentioned. And um, yeah, not all parts of the website are, are already filled with content. Yeah, but as Ben indicated, it's a fairly new company, so it's it's worth to check it maybe like every second week. Yeah, for new um, new content, new pictures. Yeah, I saw that the the picture part of the website there's um, only the historic ones, not the actual ones. But no worries, that will come. And um, yeah, as as Ben indicated, there will be um, a report being published over the next little while. There will be news flow. There will be a drill program. And I think it's a it's a as as Ben said, it's a unique story. So I urge you to at least put the company on your watch list. Again, the symbol on the CSE is Rise R I S E. And the German WKN number is A2DQVW. Okay, so thank you very much, Ben, for taking the time. Uh, it was my pleasure. So, any final words? Uh, no, no. I mean, just, yeah, like you said, there's a lot of stuff going to go on the website soon. So, yeah, it might look um, like it is like not complete, you know. So, definitely keep an eye on it. And there's going to be a lot of things happening with the company, you know, over the next couple of weeks. So, right. And you know, the good thing is you're a mining company, so you need to take care of your project first. You're not a tech company who needs a nice website. Anyway, thank you very much and um, good luck with your endeavors. Bye-bye. Great. Thanks a lot.